Baldwin Library. So everyone at Ohio University is already familiar with the photograph of Thomas Schiff. The very, very large image in our, uh, that hangs in our library entrance was taken by Tom in 2009. It's a particularly special image for us because it was the three millionth addition to our collection. Now there are only about 75 libraries in North America that have that large a collection. And it was Tom's image that brought us into that rarefied group. But Alden isn't the only library that Tom has photographed. He's traveled across the United States with his Culturama 360 panoramic camera documenting our country's libraries. His latest book, which is simply titled The Library Book, offers a unique perspective into a uniquely American institution, which is the Lending Library. In the afterword of the library book, Tom wrote that a library is invariably a statement a realization of the prevailing or forward-looking civic ideals by the architect, the philanthropist, and the community. And I couldn't agree more. Tom published his first book of photography, Panoramic Cincinnati, in 2003, and since then he's published five other books of panographic photography. He's the founder of Photofocus, a lens-based art biennial. He's a 1970 alum from Ohio University and currently lives in Cincinnati. Interviewing Tom is Dr. Marion Entertor, a special collection librarian from here in Alden Library. She's been at Ohio University since 2003. She received her PhD in history from the City University of New York and curates Alden Library's rare book collection and documentary photo archive. Please join me in welcoming Tom Schiff and Mary Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome and welcome, Tom. We're Thank you. very happy to have you here and very pleased to have your photographs on exhibit, um, and to welcome your beautiful library book, um, which there it is. you can see right here, fresh off the press. Um, there's also a copy in the exhibit, so if you haven't seen it yet, um, there's one that you can actually leaf through the pages, and I highly, highly recommend that you do so. Um, so let's start with a little bit of background. Um, Scott just mentioned that you're an alum of Ohio University. Correct. Can you tell us? Um, what you studied here um, and how the university might have impacted you and your career path. Well, I uh, came to Ohio University in 1965 and uh, started out studying photography in the, uh, the School of Fine Arts. And, but I ended up uh, switching my studies and I ended up getting a, uh, a bachelor's degree in business administration in 1970. Uh, but I never gave up photography, I always still taking pictures uh, whenever I had a spare moment. And I've been doing that, uh, doing that all along. And uh, it's been 50 years since I've been here, so that goes wow. back a few years. Wow. Um, so you've been taking photographs ever since. I guess maybe starting question would be um, what, what brought you to the university to study photography in the first place and why did you end up switching to business? Well, um, I think back then uh, there were very few colleges that offered photography as a major. I think there were just a handful, maybe three or four or five, and, uh, uh, which is a lot different from today. Right. But uh, I, I came here, you know, my whole family went to Ohio State, so I was kind oh. of the black sheep of the family, <laughs> going to OU instead of Ohio the smart State. smart one. <laughs> and uh, I studied photography and uh, studied with, with Clarence White, who uh, is uh, the son of the great Clarence White Sr. Yeah. Um, and uh, I enjoyed it, but I, I think I was a little frustrated and I just wasn't making the photos I, I shot, thought I should have been making, so I 
switched to the business world and uh, you know my family's in business so I ended up going back to Cincinnati after graduation and working in the insurance business. Okay, but taking photographs the whole time. Taking said. photos all the whole time and uh, uh, you know weekends and vacation and whenever I had a chance. Do you remember when you got your first camera? Or had you been photographing for a long time? Uh, yeah, pretty long time. I uh, in grade school I remember having little hmm little Kodak uh, brownie cameras and I remember taking it to school one day and taking pictures of my classmates and which back then was wasn't really done it was kind of unusual and today kids have uh, cell phones with cameras built in and yes. they take pictures everywhere all the time true but uh, so and then uh, in high school I spent a lot of time uh, taking pictures of school activities for the yearbook and the uh, newspaper Okay. And that was great fun. And then I had a, a buddy of mine who went to school here at the same time, Paul Schranz, who uh, taught photography for many years at Governor State University. And he's retired now, living in uh, New Mexico. And Paul and I would go out and we'd, we'd spend, uh, get together for a weekend and go out and take photos. And uh, for many years, I kind of stuck to uh, large format photography. I had a four by five and an eight by 10 view camera. And uh, back then black and white was the big thing. And uh, that's what I did for many, many years. And I think about 25 or so years ago, I felt I needed to change direction a little bit. And, and I don't know how I stumbled upon it, but somehow I discovered panoramic photography and uh, did a little investigating in it. And, uh, decided to buy a camera and try it out mm -hmm. and uh, I liked it and and I've decided then to, to switch from black and white to color because the technology had improved greatly uh, over that period of time. So you were already interested in large format when you came across panoramic. What is it about that that format that that interested you then and has continued to draw you to it um, through, well, through the present day? Yeah, I, well, I think when you work in a large format camera with a 4x5 or an 8x10 camera, you, you're, you have to be in the habit of uh, putting the camera on a tripod and setting up the camera and focusing uh, the lens. And it's kind of a time-consuming process, so it kind of forces you to slow down and take a look at what you're doing. and. Uh, Back then, sheet film was, you know, relatively expensive, uh, unlike digital, which you can take a thousand pictures and then delete them all if you don't like them. Back then, uh, you know, you had to pay, pay for film and take the time to process it. So it was kind of an easy transition to the panoramic camera because you, you still have to set it up on a tripod. And, and I remember, uh, Going to Las Vegas, I did a book on uh, uh, panoramic photos of Las Vegas about uh, nine or ten years ago. And you know, you set the camera up, and then you kind of have to wait for the the sun to, to set a little bit, where you have a good blend of uh, illumination from from the light bulbs on the strip in Las Vegas, but still have a little bit of daylight left to uh, lighten up the sky. So as you sit there waiting, uh, hundreds of tourists will walk by, uh, pick out the camera and take a quick picture and move on. And uh, in the time it takes me to, to shoot a, a panoramic photo, uh, somebody's already taken 50 photographs in the area. So huh. uh, you have to kind of s stop and slow down and contemplate things. And that's part of what appeals to yeah, you about know, yeah. the process. And then when you take a picture at sunset, you never know when the right moment is. So you end up taking a few pictures uh, a few minutes before sunset, and you wait, and you take another one, and then uh, another one or a couple of minutes after sunset, and another one uh, just before it gets completely dark. So you might be at a location uh, for a half hour or so uh, shooting two or three or four rolls of film. 
So you have to be patient. <laughs> to be patient, yeah. Has your process changed with the switch to digital or not so much with panoramic? Uh, not so much with panoramic. I've, I've uh, used a few digital panoramic cameras and I've never really been satisfied with them. <clears throat> I think one of the problems is that uh, the technology, uh, you know, the design of a camera is, requires a lot of attention and engineering and uh, there really aren't a, a big enough demand for panoramic cameras to justify companies constantly updating the technology. So the technology on some of those cameras was already maybe five or ten years dated. So I just stuck with film. Uh, once the film's developed, I'll have the, uh, the negative digitized and then from the digital uh, file why then it goes into Photoshop and mm -hmm. I treat it like a regular digital picture. After, after the fact. Yeah. Um, the, there's also a difference though between panoramic photogra photography and the 360 perspective that, or the camera that you use, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, there, well, uh, there's yeah. one of the cameras is over there. It's the, the white box camera there. That's called a Halterama. And uh, it, it actually sits on a tripod and when you turn on, turn the switch, that starts the motor and the camera swings around in a circle and makes a, uh, an image that actually uh, could exceed 360 degrees. And you'll notice on some of the photographs, if you look to the extreme left and right of the picture, you'll see the same image. So it's, a, it's an image that actually overlaps itself so it's maybe a 300 or a 300, 390 degrees so or so image, uh, but it's it's not new technology. It's very old. Uh, back over 100 years ago, there was a company called the Circuit uh, Camera Company, and they made panoramic cameras, and uh, uh, you know uses a my camera uses uh, just regular Kodak roll film that's two and a quarter inches high by three feet long or so. Uh, back then, they didn't have enlargers and they didn't have darkroom enlargers. So in order to make a photograph, you had to make a print the same size as the negatives. So they had very large negatives. They had a, a uh, the film was 10 inches high, maybe by five or 10 feet long. And uh, when you looked at the roll, it looked kind of like a, a player piano roll that you put in a player piano. So how do you develop and print film that's negatives that are that size? Um, you uh, just have a, a kind of a big tub of uh, just regular black and white developer and uh, you submerge it in, in the developer and then kind of roll it back and forth for, you know, eight or nine or ten minutes, whatever you needed to develop it, and then uh, stop bath and fix it and wash it and just hang it up on a clothesline. Okay. And then you had to make a print, so I had a, uh, a contact printer that was uh, about four feet wide by a foot uh, long, foot deep, and you, know, you lay the negative out and then you put photographic paper on top of the negative and then uh, tighten the, uh, the contact between of them and, and then expose it and develop the uh, paper just pretty much the same as the, the roll of film. But with the Halterama, it's a little more convenient because uh, you're not dealing with 10 inch film, you're dealing with film that's two and a quarter inches wide. So it's a little easier to manage. Okay, still sounds unwieldy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned there a little bit about the history um, of panoramic photography and we've included in the exhibit some um, books from the Rare Book and Fine Arts collections um, about that document, the history of panoramic photography. And I guess I was curious um, what about the history or how much did you research the history when you were getting into panor panoramic um, photography and, and what's, what, has, what kind of impact has it had on you? Well. Um I just pretty much tried to dig up a few books on panoramic photography, and I remember coming across uh, E.O. Goldbeck, which uh, there's a book yeah. here of his photographs. He was a photographer in Texas who used a circuit camera, okay. 
and uh, he was alive back then. I remember I talked to him on the phone once oh. for a little bit, and I wanted to send a, a video crew down to Texas to interview him, uh, but he said he was suffering from cancer and couldn't participate, and then I think about six months later or so he was dead, but he was a real workaholic, and he traveled around and made uh, a lot of uh, panoramic photos and then conventional photos uh, for the military. Oh, interesting. And then um, he was also a member of a group called the uh, International Association of Panoramic Photographers, mm -hmm. and they had a, a meeting once a year that would be held in Las Vegas or Orlando, Florida, or California. And I went to a few of those and uh, got to meet other photographers and meet vendors who had uh, different types of cameras for sale. Mm -hmm. Um, you also told a fascinating story when we were speaking really briefly before this began about um, a very particular camera that somebody built. I think, would you mind telling oh. that again? <laughs> well, this is, this is about a, 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 a talk that somebody gave. In fact, it was one of those meetings uh -huh. of the panoramic photographers. A fellow did some research and uh, found some un very kind of uh, unusual, unique, maybe offbeat ways of people made photographs a long time ago. And one fellow made a camera out of a railroad car. Um, so he would make a photograph. Uh, he put a lens on one side of the uh, camera car or one side of the railroad car and put uh, either photographic paper or film on the opposite side. So this, this uh, boxcar and it essentially became a camera. And uh, it was stationary. He moved it into position or whatever he wanted to photograph and uh, opened the lens and exposed it and uh, developed the uh, paper. And he had a, a, a photograph that was uh, maybe 10 or 15 feet high by 30 feet wide. Uh -huh. And uh, talked about another fellow that uh, had a kite and he attached a camera. And this was over 100 years ago, before they had airplanes. So he uh, had kind of, it was kind of a large kite because they had to hold this camera that was probably five or 10 pounds. And uh, attached the camera to the kite and flew it up in the air. And when the, when the kite and the camera looked like it was lined up, the way he wanted to make a photograph, he'd pull a string that uh, released the shutter on the camera. And uh, from that <coughs> photo they made, uh, someone would make uh, engravings of aerial scenes of towns. And maybe you've seen them uh, in museums or antique stores of uh, an aerial view of a town <coughs> that was made in the 1800s. And you'd say, well, how did they get that up there? Because there weren't any airplanes back then. But that's, okay. that's how they did it. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, OK, well, let's switch to talking a little bit about your current project, um, the library book. Um, here's a couple of photos um, of your photographs of Alden. Um, and there's some of these on this floor and also on the second floor. Um, why libraries? Well, uh, about uh, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I. Uh, I had always taken photos of architecture when I did black and white. Mm -hmm. And then when I switched to uh, panoramic color, I still continued that. And a good friend of mine who's an architect <coughs> who was very knowledgeable about uh, uh, a lot of the uh, architectural landmarks around the country, uh, he said, well, here's a list of about 15 or 20 uh, places that you ought to go to and take photos by these well-known architects. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a little bit. I'd travel out to California or New York, take some photos. <coughs> and then um, after a while, I, I noticed um, I had a lot of, uh, not a lot, a few photos of libraries, mm -hmm. uh, movie theaters, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright sites, uh, scenes from San Francisco and uh, scenes from a place called Columbus, Indiana that has a lot of 
uh, unique mid-century modern architecture. So I thought it, it would be good to have uh, separate projects because if I was going to California, uh, I might not go back to California for several years. So mm -hmm. while I was there, uh, I'd be sure to look up uh, a few libraries, look up a few movie theaters, mm -hmm. and uh, I might only have two or three photos of libraries on one trip, but I'd have two or three photos from all the other projects. Okay. And those became book projects that essentially took 10 to 15 years by the time uh, we got around to all the different locations in the country. Mm -hmm. But I just noticed that uh, I did, most of my research just consisted of uh, looking at pictures on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I was going to San Francisco, say I would uh, uh, dig up some information on, on the libraries and generally speaking the well-designed really uh, good looking libraries would have a lot of photos of them so okay. it was kind of easy to pick out the uh, libraries I wanted to go to so uh, because I was taking a picture inside I had to have permission from from somebody from okay. the uh, uh, the administration or from the librarian. So I'd always have to call a couple of weeks ahead yeah. because it, sometimes it took a while to track down the right person to talk to. Right, interesting. Um, so one striking thing about the library photographs, um, I don't know how well you can see it on the screen here, but um, definitely see it when you're looking at the exhibit or the book, which is, um, some of the more traditional historic libraries tend to be full of rows upon rows of bookshelves filled sure. with books. And then some of the newer constructions um, or remodels tend to be much more open space, um, seating areas, and sometimes like this library, virtually no books to be seen. Um, and I just wonder if are those distinctions that you are trying to document or you choose the library based on um, the architecture or something else? Um, do you think there's something important about conveying sort of this evolution of the library? Well, um, I really kind of based it on the architecture. I was looking for a unique architecture that uh, was very well designed and, and had a real impact. And I found that the, the libraries that, that were like that, say the uh, the Boston Athenaeum, uh, they paid particular attention to make the, the place look uh, in really good shape all the time. And of course, uh, you can see the books, and there were some, a lot of libraries that would have an atrium or a central area where you couldn't, didn't have a lot of books to look at. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, you know, they didn't look as much like libraries because there weren't any books around. Uh, but uh, just about all the libraries had a collection of books somewhere. The, uh, there was one library out in uh, Berkeley, California mm -hmm. that uh, called itself an all digital library and there weren't any books in there but there were uh, desks and chairs and people studying and, and they had their laptops open and they were looking things up on the computer. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, but, you know, but I think there's still a, a, a big need and a big demand for librarians because uh, I think the, uh, Google in, and a computer is good for answering simple questions. Uh, you know, what's the population of search like Nevada? Mm -hmm. But uh, if you ask it a complex question, uh, it has a little trouble. And a, a librarian can help you navigate the library and find the, the answers that you need for your particular project. Well, we like to hear that. <laughs> can use that in our promotional materials. Yeah. Um, but a related question, um, sort of stemming from that and also from what you said about people studying, a lot of your interiors appear to be devoid of people. Um, and I wonder if that's um, on, by design, because you really want the focus to be on the architecture, um, or if it's something that's inevitable because it takes you so long to get the shot that you need. Um, did you photograph these places when they were closed? Um, and also from the librarian's perspective, I think for us, having a full library is really a point of, of pride and something we feel is very important. So 
do you think there's any, um, I'm not sure, um, not risk exactly, but um, what the impact of showing empty libraries? Well, um, some of the uh, libraries were concerned about uh, having their patrons in the photograph. Uh, and for privacy reasons, they said, well, you can come take photos, but we'd like you to show up an hour before it's open. Okay. So I would go in and take photos as fast as I could. And then uh, about an hour later, people would start to drift in. So I was, I was done taking photos. Okay. Others, uh, they weren't concerned about that. Um, and sometimes there, there are people in the photographs, but they're just not a lot. So right. it's just whenever I, whenever I get there. That makes sense. Um, do you have a favorite interior and exterior, I guess? It's some, these are both interiors, but you also take exteriors. Do you have a favorite? Um, yeah, I, I like mostly the interior photos. I think that's where the panoramic camera works best because it can work in kind of tight quarters. And, mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. is probably one of the most spectacular uh, libraries around. That's in the exhibit. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, the Boston Athenaeum yeah. <coughs> is very uh, nice in its own way. It's not, a, it's not a, quite as big, but it's a little more intimate. And, uh, but it's very nice. Um, there's a little library in... in uh, a small town outside of Philadelphia, the uh, Given Library, that's uh, really pretty unique. And, and what's nice about it is it's one that, that's uh, not a high profile library. It's not like the Library of Congress that everybody's seen a photo of, mm -hmm. but it's a, a small town library, but it's really immaculate in, the, in its design and upkeep. And uh, it's in the book. I don't think it's in the exhibit, no. but uh, that's one to look up because it's, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, the Salt Lake City Library is pretty spectacular. Uh, if you've ever been there or have you ever seen that. Uh, the uh, Seattle Public Library right. is very modern and very contemporary and has a lot of odd angles and a lot of uh, uh, metal construction, and so it's, it's pretty unique in its own way. Do you strive to get a balance between um, historic and modern, and also between these sort of very well-known spaces and small town or school libraries that most people would not have seen otherwise? Um, I, I don't really start out trying to have a balance. I just uh, try to get as many libraries as I can on any one particular visit. Uh, so it's kind of worked out that I've got a, a wide range. Uh, one of the earliest, or the earliest library is uh, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, mm -hmm. which was in his house. And I think it was probably a reconstruction of the library because the, the house at one time was very run down and very poor shape, but they fixed it up and restored it and it's open to the public. Yeah. And I think at one time he sold his books to the, to, uh, to the United States government to, Congress, to start yeah. the Library of Congress. Right. So uh, that's... Where they burned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there's a, a very contemporary uh, library at the University of Chicago mm -hmm. that was just built maybe six or seven years ago. Yeah. And that's kind of neat. It has a big glass and metal dome. and mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It's, uh, I don't think it's in the exhibit, but it's, yeah. it's in the book, there's a copy of the book. I yes. just brought a, a shipment with me today when we, uh, when we arrived. Yes, so. thank you for that. <laughs> did you do the Yale library? Uh, yes, I, uh, I did a few photos of the, uh, the Sterling Library and they have a, uh, I think it's the Haas Family Library, of, it's kind of a mid-century modern. And uh, the, the uh, Beinecke rare book that's, that's in the book, so look, look that up. That was designed by uh, SOM Architects. And that's where the light comes right through the walls. Yeah, yes. it's, it's, um, it's the, the walls are actually marble, but the marble's thin. It's thin enough that sunlight comes through, but the, uh, the marble gives kind of a, a yellow glow to the light coming through, so it really kind of protects the books 
Uh, it's like putting a big filter on a window so the, the daylight doesn't uh, hurt the books. And I think since then they've, they've done a, a refurbishment of that museum. But when I took the picture, I think it looked fabulous when I took it about 10 years ago. Beautiful space. Um, I, being from the Bay Area, I couldn't resist this photo. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you'd mentioned preferring um, interiors, of libraries at least, to the mm -hmm. exteriors. Um, you also have a lot of landscapes. Um, how do you, it seems like there's, you enjoy taking photographs of the outside as much as, as the inside. Is right. that architectural also, or? Um, well, I'm, I'm working on a project in San Francisco. Okay. Of a, I'm going to do a book of San Francisco uh, panoramic photos uh, of mostly architecture. But when you go to San Francisco, uh, everybody expects that you have a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> so there it is. And it was actually made. Uh, in, in, in the water, in the, uh, in the bay, and uh, you can see both sides of the bridge. Yeah. And I uh, hired a little fishing boat uh, to take me out and uh, set the camera up, and I had to deal with the, the boat rocking back and forth it's because it takes you know, a few seconds for the camera to swing around in a circle. So yeah. I kind of timed it right while it was Temporary, temporarily uh, level <laughs> and made that photo right around sunset. I wouldn't have guessed that was on a boat. Yeah. Um, I also had a question about your, um, most, we just talked about spaces being devoid of people, but then you have some of these photographs which are all about the people, I think, and I just wondered how that impacts your, impacts your process if there's so much movement um, and so many different people in. Um, well, I, yeah, this is the, uh, the speech that John, John Glenn Glenn. gave, um, and this is a, a, a photo that I used for a project uh, for, on the bicentennial, bicentennial of Ohio, which was in 2003. So starting about 1998, I uh, traveled around the state several times and made photos, and I knew he was going to give a speech uh, up at the state house, so I... Uh, arranged to uh, allow myself to take a photo. And of course, you can see the, the, the vantage point is a little higher. All these people uh, on, the, on kind of the eye level, ground level, are a little bit lower than me. So I have a, a, a camera that actually lifts up and it'll go up 10 or 20 feet to get oh. kind of an elevated view. And uh, you know, this is a photo made outside in, in daylight, so uh, the camera was set for a pretty high speed, so uh, you know the camera only took about two seconds to go around in a circle, and that was the equivalent of maybe a, a 30th or a 60th of a second, which was enough to slow people down and, and mm -hmm. get a sharp image, even if they're moving. And the same for the Oktoberfest right. celebration in Cincinnati. Uh, you can see the dancers there who were moving, but uh, the camera was moving fast enough to uh, to slow them down. So are you are you up on a ladder that high, or <coughs> no? The camera, the, uh, the, I'm on the ground, okay. and the camera and the tripod are right there. But I have a center post on my tripod that I can lift the camera up and tighten it and lift another section up. Okay. So uh, the camera here was maybe 15 feet in the air. And then uh, kind of the, uh, the fun things that I learned about later, uh, this photo appeared in a book um, for the Cincinnati. I did a book on Cincinnati, and also this was in the Ohio book. Mm -hmm. And one of the fellows in our office came in and said, I don't know if you know it or not, but that's my dad right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, <laughs> I've heard stories about people who said, I got your book, but I found a picture of my dad. Uh, one fellow found a picture of his daughter who was uh, sled riding at the park. Hmm. So uh, you don't find these things out till later. So um, since you mentioned that, one thing we'd like to talk about at Authors at Alden, since we're in the library, is research process. and. Um, how do you pre-research your sites or post-research if something really struck you once you had spent some time there? 
How does that work? Well, um, when I started doing the panoramic photos and decided to do the book projects, <coughs> I concentrated uh, locally and do, I did a book on Cincinnati. And of course, um, these are locations I've been to hundreds of times, you know, since I was a kid, so I was pretty familiar with them. Um, but I'd have to kind of figure out where, where the action's going to be at what time of the day. Mm -hmm. And I had to make sure that the sun was behind me mm -hmm. uh, so I could have the uh, sun shine in, on the central part of the photograph. Okay. So you have to kind of be aware if something's going to happen early in the morning yeah. or late in the afternoon, that, that's going to determine where the camera is going to be positioned. Okay. But then when I go out of town uh, to take a photo in California, uh, I know I might not be back there for a year or two or three. Right. So I kind of have to, to kind of cover myself. I, I take probably more photos than I would otherwise, mm -hmm. hoping that uh, if one of the pictures was goofed up, there was another one that would work right. out. Um, I want to leave time for audience questions, but my last question, you mentioned your next project is San Francisco. Um, I wonder if you have sort of a dream project that you are working on or would love to work on someday? Well, I'm, I'm kind of working on those right now. Okay. I've, I've made most of my photographs for all these projects. It's just a question of getting the, the time to put the books together. I am actually having two more books come out this year. Oh. Um, I did a book of Frank Lloyd Wright sites about nine or ten years ago, mm -hmm. uh, traveling around the country, and there are about 500 Frank Lloyd Wright sites still in existence in, in America, mm -hmm. and uh, we photographed over a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but when I photographed the, the sites in Ohio, I made sure to make extra photographs uh, to do another book, which is at the printer right now. <clears throat> and we're doing that in conjunction with the Ohio History Connection mm -hmm. and the, the Westcott House. And the Westcott House is a public uh, Frank Lloyd Wright site that's open to the public up in Springfield, Ohio. Oh. And they're going to have a big party uh, on June 10th to celebrate Frank Lloyd Wright's 150th birthday. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of anxious to get the book printed and back in time for the big celebration. I'm doing another book of Cincinnati since, uh, <clears throat> well, since this photo was made in Cincinnati, the whole, this is the Fountain Square area, which is the center of town. Uh, they've completely remodeled this, and they've uh, eliminated a lot of these structures in here. So this is kind of an outdated photo. So over the last few years, I've made a lot of new photos of Cincinnati, okay. and they have a new riverfront park. and. Yeah a new skyline with new buildings. So uh, that's a book that's going to come out uh, sometime a little bit before Christmas. Okay. And it's going to be a fundraiser for the local animal shelter, oh. SPCA Cincinnati. And Very then nice. um, probably in about a year and a half or so, uh, we'll have the uh, San Francisco project wrapped up. And that'll be a book and ex exhibition. and. Uh, also, I've been working on movie theaters, so mm -hmm. I photographed uh, probably close to 200 movie theaters around the country. Mm -hmm. And some of them are the old grand uh, theaters that uh, are very decorative and, and stylish. Yeah. Um, and there are a few new ones. It's hard to find a new theater that looks nice. Most <laughs> of them are kind of big and boxy and kind of ugly looking. But right. there are a few good looking ones around. So we photographed those and, and that'll be hopefully an exhibition at the Museum of Moving Image oh. up in uh, Queens, New York. Very cool. Yeah. So we have several projects to look forward to. Right, okay. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Thanks. Love to take some time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, please come up and use the mic. Uh, I'm Mark Marinelli. I don't know if you have business law for me uh, or not. I taught the College of Business when you were here. Uh, um, yeah, I had <laughs> 1968 maybe. Yeah, well, I yeah. was here teaching. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, 
one, does your photography lend itself to art museums and uh, the collections at an art museum? And second of all, when you talked about movie theaters, I thought of our Stewart Opera House in Nelsonville. And you know, that would be an interesting project. It's old opera, I don't know how many are still there, but it's not the same as a movie theater, but it's certainly of an interest. Uh, yeah, that, well, uh, that would be, a, that could be a good question I could have planted because uh, I made several photographs of opera houses around Ohio for kind of a semi-finished project and the Stewart Opera House is in that selection. And I think uh, back in the old days, when they have a community meeting place um, and they built a theater, I think they called it an opera house because it sounded a little classier than just saying the downtown theater. Mm -hmm. But the Stewart Opera House, and I've been working on also a lot of art museums and uh, photographed um, the Museum of Modern Art and uh, uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the San Francisco de Young Museum and the uh, Legion of Honor. So those are all in future projects that uh, don't have a timeline yet. Right. And they're, they're building a lot of new museums and a lot of additions to uh, existing museums. So there's a lot left to photograph. Thank you. Thank you. So Tom, you talked a little bit about um, the placement of the camera. But this seems to be, this kind of photography would be a particular challenge, I would think, about how you determine where to place a camera from what perspective that you get. Could you sort of? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, when you're inside a room, uh, generally you, you try to place the camera in the middle of the room. Uh, you want to have a location that has something to look at in all four directions. and. Uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, a photographer using a conventional camera will back himself into the corner to get as wide a view as he can, uh, but you can't do that with a panoramic camera. Uh, you have to be kind of in the middle of the room. And also, it helps a little to elevate the camera because if you take a photo from the ground level, half of the picture will be the floor and the light stand and uh, the rug and and stuff that really kind of clutters up the photograph. And when you're outside, uh, you know, you have parked cars, you have stop signs and mailboxes and sewer lids. So if you elevate the camera 10 or 20 feet, uh, you get above all that. And those things might be in the picture, but they'll be very small. And uh, you won't have uh, anything blocking the view from that height. Any other questions? So you referenced a panoramic photo photographer group, and I was curious as to how many photographers do do this kind of work. And then secondly, I was reminded that on Tuesday, I saw students you know, using their iPhone to take the panoramic photo, which certainly lends itself to think that this will continue on with, with younger people having an interest in this kind of photography just from the experience of using their iPhones. Right, yeah, well, um, this was a, a group that I went to several meetings probably uh, 25 years ago, and it's the International Association of Panoramic Photographers, and there are only about a thousand members, so mm -hmm. compare that to the millions of cameras that are manufactured over a given period of time, and it's, so you can see it's a pretty small selection of photographers. So not a lot of photographers uh, do it, uh, there have been, uh, there's a book that kind of uh, reviews the, the, the various panoramic cameras that have been around, and they're pretty obscure. You just never see those cameras very often. So uh, it's kind of specialized. Uh, the camera I use, the Hulturama, uh, when I bought it, uh, it was serial number 124. So there have only been 124 made up till then. And I bought one maybe three or four years later and it was a serial number like 129. <laughs> so they, they didn't make a lot of them. It was made in a machine shop uh, one at a time, and, and the manufacturer, uh, the guy that started at Charles Hulcher, was an engineer, and he also made a lot of 
high-speed cameras that were used by NASA. They would uh, bolt these cameras onto the, uh, the structures next to rockets down at uh, Cape Canaveral. And when the, when the rocket went up, they'd take all these photographs with all these different cameras. And then if the, if the rocket blew up, they can go back and look at the photos and try to figure out what happened. And sometimes some of the cameras would get blown up too, but that was what part of the such risk. A, a camera cost? Maybe that accounts for so few people doing it. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the camera was about 5000 My camera was about $5,000. And it had a lot of machine parts in it and a motor and just used a conventional Mamiya lens. So just a regular lens you put on a, a conventional camera. And the high-speed cameras, I don't know what those ran. I'm sure they're, they were more expensive. I think they had a big, big roll of film and they turned it. It spun very fast and made several photographs uh, in one second. I know Tom pretty well, but I wanted you to, um, if you could mention your interest in photography dating back to your time here at Ohio University in the study of the history of photography and that how that lends itself to your involvement in wanting to help form educational endeavors toward the history of photography. For example, a lecture series in Cincinnati. You also produced a lot of videos of interviews with artists Well, yeah, that's, that's a good, good topic. Uh, I remember I was taking a class taught by Clarence White, and uh, the son of Clarence White, uh, he's Clarence White Jr., the son of Clarence White, the, one of the photo secessionists. And uh, this is before I knew the history of photography, before I took the course at OU on the history of photography. And he talked about uh, growing up uh, in New York as a little kid, and he talked about his dad uh, mom and dad uh, having folks over for dinner, and the folks that would came came for dinner would be Alfred Stiglitz and Edward Steichen, and those are people I didn't know much about until I took the history of photography, and I found out those were the the leaders of photography back back in those days, and then uh, later um, uh, I was a part owner of a, of a nonprofit gallery in Cincinnati, a photography gallery. And then we decided to do some video interviews. So we uh, contacted several photographers around the country. And uh, they agreed to be interviewed. And uh, this was 35 years ago. And a lot of these folks are deceased. But we interviewed uh, Ralph Steiner and Willard Van Dyke, uh, Elliot Porter. Uh, Willard, uh, well, Willard Van Dyke was the one of the founders of uh, Group F64, which was a very well-known group of photographers who members were Edward Weston and Ansel Adams. And uh, we interviewed Barbara Morgan and uh, Arthur Tress. And then uh, later, um, about seven or eight years ago, uh, we started Photo Focus. And Mary Ellen's now the director of Photo Focus, and that's the uh, uh, photography festival in Cincinnati that comes up every two years. And uh, uh, every other October, um, we've had about 60 exhibits, 60 photography exhibits in Cincinnati. So it's been very uh, successful, and uh, we've had a lot of cooperation from the museums and uh, universities and uh, for-profit galleries. So it's coming up again in, in 2018. So mark your calendar and come to Cincinnati. Any other questions? Um, can I, I'm actually going to ask a really quick um, follow-up question sure. to education. Um, what's striking about the photographs is that the 360 panoramic perspective captures a perspective that the human eye can't naturally see. Um, and 
being in the university setting, I wonder how you hope or would like students to interact with the photographs, to view them, to learn from them? Uh, that's a good question. When, when people look at the photographs, and it's, it's more apparent on the interiors, uh, they appear very distorted. Uh, straight lines. Uh, oh, there's falling water. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there's uh, one of the Gaudi uh, churches. And you see there are a lot of arches. Well, those are actually straight lines. But the, but the panoramic camera uh, makes them look curved. And, uh, um, and people think it's distorted, but actually that's how the human eye sees. Um, when you look at a building, you look at that wall, and you know that that's a square wall, um, but your eye doesn't see it that way. If you were to say to look at uh, this beam here, uh, in your mind, you know it's a straight beam, but if you were to point to the, the corner of the beam and trace it all the way over, uh, what you find is you make an arc with your hand. So uh, the panoramic lens sees that arc, uh, but when you look at it with your eyeball, uh, your brain knows it's a straight line, so you see it as a straight line. So. Uh, uh, in fact, that was kind of a problem in the early days of photography. Uh, photographers would make a camera and they would just use a simple magnifying lens and they would take a picture of, uh, if this was a wall or this was a window, they'd take a picture of the window uh, with this simple lens and when they made the print, they'd find out that it wasn't a square window, it was kind of barrel shaped. They had a curve at the bottom and the top and the sides. And they looked at that and they said, well, that's not what a window looks like. It has straight, straight uh, lines on it. So what they did was they corrected the lens. They manufactured the lens in such a way that it, it took out that curvature. And that was called a rectilinear lens uh, because that's what people want to see when they look at a photograph. That's Barcelona? That's Barcelona. And you know, this picture depicts what you've been talking about. Because when I remember standing there looking at Gaudi's masterpiece. And when you're in front of the main altar, I mean, your eye span is lucky to take in that one circle there with the main altar. But you don't see the depth and the perception of that. This, this picture is such a just so perfect for what you just described. Oh, thanks. Well, you can see on the right side, uh, there's a dark doorway. Uh, and, that, and the same one is over on this side. And that's actually the doorway behind you as you stand there and look at the altar. So when you stand there, you see the altar, you turn to your left and you see this arch, turn to your right and see that arch, and turn around behind you and you see uh, the doorway that leads into the, the crypt. That church, for anybody who's going to go to Barcelona, <laughs> do your homework and read about that church before you go there, because in that church, the entire history of Christianity can be found. Every bit of it. All right, well, please join me in thanking Tom again, and I hope everybody has time to visit the exhibit and look at the book that is in the exhibit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. I think I think I saw some cookies back there too. Yes. Also, please help yourself to refreshments. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>